Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, it's really wonderful to have everyone join us this morning for our first in a series of three workshops on California's first open source groundwater accounting and trading platform. My name is Christina Babbitt and I work for Environmental Defense Fund where I manage our California groundwater program. For those of you who might not be familiar with EDF, we're a large international environmental nonprofit and we work across natural resource issue areas to devise solutions that work both for people and for nature and science and economics is at the core of our work. I'm gonna be one of the hosts for our workshop today along with my colleague, Rana Kelly, who will help moderate the Q&A session at the end. Um, but, and before we get started, I just wanna let everyone know that we are recording today's session and we'll send out a link of the recording to everyone who has registered for, for the um, workshop today by the end of the week. So the goal of today's workshop is to provide participants with a deeper understanding of the various components of the water accounting and trading platform, which was designed to enable water managers and landowners to develop more accurate water budgets, facilitate water trading and minimize undesirable results through the use of a groundwater modeling decision support tool. So EDF has been involved in this project over the last several years because we feel that it's really important to develop accurate and accessible information on water availability and use. And it's really critical to use this information to design healthy water trading programs or in the design or implementation of other water um, management actions. And we're also really excited about the use of Olson's groundwater modeling decision support tool to design projects that promote beneficial outcomes. So our workshop today is um, around two hours and here's just a brief overview of how we'll run the session today. I'm first gonna briefly introduce today's speakers who will provide an overview and live demos of the water accounting and trading platform, as well as the get scenario analysis tool. And then we'll briefly talk about how you can tailor the platform, um, specifically looking at some different water accounting options. And then we'll look into the future at workshops two and workshops three to provide you a little bit of insight in what's to come. And then we'll save the last 30 minutes for questions and answers. Um, just to let everyone know, we're going to save all the questions for the end of the end of the session. If any questions come to mind, please chat the, uh, type those into the chat box. Everyone will be able to see them. If you want to send a private message or a question just to the moderators, you can go ahead and use the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. And then, like I said, we'll, we'll save those um, for a good discussion at the end. So I now want to briefly introduce our speakers for today. So if John, you can go to the next slide. Perfect. So today we have with us John Burns, who is an engineer with Sika Technology Group out of Portland, Oregon. And we also have with us uh, Kathleen Elmquist, who's a business analyst with, with Sitka. And you can see her waving on the screen, but no picture on our beautiful um, slide. We also have Jim Snyder, who is a senior scientist at Olson, which is an engineering firm out of Lincoln, Nebraska. And Jim was uh, previously with Nebraska's Department of Natural Resources as the Deputy Director. And we have Eric Everett, who is a General Manager of Rosedale Rio Bravo Water Storage District in Kern County, California. And I'll add that he's also a visionary water leader in California who is really leading the charge in California when it comes to innovative water management um, action and leadership. So we're really excited to have this team together um, to provide you with an overview of the platform. And with that, I'll turn it over to Eric. All right, thank you, Christina, for the kind words and also um, for the introductions. Uh, good morning, everybody. I um, have a couple of slides and I really was tasked with providing an overview of the platform. And Christina kind of touched on what I would call or characterize as the three components. Um, first and foremost is the water accounting component. Um, and that is very much the backbone of the platform itself um, and was developed really in response to the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and the requirement that um, those that stepped forward in the capacity of a groundwater sustainability agency um, develop water budgets to finally connect land use and water supply. And so the thinking within Rosedale was that um, while water districts certainly will be performing this function, we recognize the need to connect that information to the landowner level so that as they um, we're, we're dealing with the challenges of Sigma, especially in a critically overdrafted basin. They had the information necessary to make land use planning decisions 
whether or not they should plant, whether they should plant uh, more or less or fallow. Um, and so the accounting platform is really our, our, our um, component that allows landowners to get that type of information. And John and Christine and others are gonna certainly speak to that um, in more, much more detail. Uh, the other part of the platform is the trading platform. That's the one I think that's probably generated the most interest, although I'm, I know landowners are very interested in having um, you know, the real-time information, if you will, from a water budget perspective. But the trading platform um, was uh, a necessary part of that, um, especially in a world where you have uh, different land uses, different water supply needs. Um, and we wanted to kind of create some connections that would allow landowners to manage the resource. And so historically that has fallen to the water districts, but again, um, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act really um, kind of drives down the decision-making to um, the landowner level. And we felt that um, the ability to move water and affect transactions really gave landowners um, the advantage and the opportunity to uh, more effectively manage the resource. And, and frankly, we wanted the water district to get out of the way and allow those landowners to implement and affect those transactions based on a buyer or seller role that they may see. Uh, we learned a lot actually um, in the trading side from um, a gentleman named Mike Young from Australia who came and, and toured our region and kind of talked a little bit about what we would call the Australian model. Um, and what we did is kind of borrowed extensively from their experience. And uh, Mike was very adamant that the backbone of any trading system is trust and accountability and reliability in the numbers that you're trading. And so the accounting platform is certainly the backbone, as I mentioned, the trading platform adds on to that um, and allows us to, to create that additional service. Um, the third component, and Christina alluded to this, is the, the groundwater management tool um, that allows us to measure the effects of those transactions that may occur. And we certainly see the value in that and want to make sure that as we facilitate perhaps different trades from one region in the district to another, um, that those are informed with um, information, real-time um, hydrogeologic information to ensure that we're not creating pumping depressions or facilitating transactions that may create migrant um, uh, contaminant flue migration or water quality impacts because of depth. Um, and so the tool, the, 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 uh, what we call the groundwater elevation tool, the, the GET, really gives us uh, the ability to uh, analyze those trades um, either before they happen or certainly um, perhaps maybe it's a larger trade while it's happening and uh, be protective and compliant with Sigma as we do so. Um, so the three of those working together really we feel give us a, a fairly robust system that um, again puts the, the landowners in a little bit better position with respect to managing the resource. Um, we very much enjoyed working with uh, environmental defense firm Sitka and Olson Technologies as we've kind of developed this the last thing I'm going to touch on before I uh, turn it over to the next presenter, um, the picture on the slide shows kind of a, a working group, if you will. Um, one of the things that's most valuable as we developed this resource was that we did it with landowners that represented different perspectives within our district. Um, and it took uh, a, a number of meetings where we um, you know, developed a part of the work product, brought it to the landowners, had them functionally test it. Uh, solicited their input. We wanted it to be something that they would actually use. So we didn't want to put too many bells and whistles. We wanted to put just the right amount in um, and feel that that process really allowed us to develop something that uh, the landowners will be responsive to and, and comfortable using um, because it was largely based on their input. So um, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll finish my time and turn it over to the next presenter. But again, very excited about having this platform and, and working with the group that's here. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Christina. Um, hi, everybody. I'm John Burns, as Sitka said, with or as Christina said, with Sitka Technology Group, and I'm going to go through a couple of slides just explaining what the water accounting and trading platform is at a high level, and then we'll move on to an interactive demo. Um, so first, uh, I just wanted to note that the, on the left here, you can see some logos from the project team. We have Eric with Rosedale and Christina with EDF, myself with Sitka and then uh, Jim with Olson. I also wanted to give credit to the Westwater Research and Economics firm who set the foundation for the platform alongside Rosedale 
um, by building out uh, some, some mock-ups and some vision. And they're not presenting with us today, but I wanted to recognize their role in the foundation of the platform. And then also the Open ET project team has been a great partner in making um, their data integrations available and uh, working side by side with them to figure out how to bring in the evapotranspiration measurements from the satellites. And so I wanted to give some credit to the Open ET team as um, great partners on this project who aren't um, with us on the presenters panel today. So the water accounting and trading platform is made up of multiple components, as you see in the diagram here. And the idea was to make this fairly modular as um, EDF envisioned a platform that while we're building it to um, pilot in Rosedale and meet Rosedale's needs as a, an application that they can um, use for years to come, we wanted to build modular components that could be applicable to other districts or other geographies and can be expanded within Rosedale over time. I mean, each component can be used or not and tailored to a specific purpose. So I'm going to go through each of these components before I dive into the demo. Um, first is the, the water usage component of water accounting. And here we're relying in the Rosedale platform on satellite-based measurements of evapotranspiration um, that are being provided by the, the Open ET team. Um, they provide a calibrated ensemble of multiple evapotranspiration models that can be automatically synchronized into a web application and made available to landowners, producers, and districts. Um, this is a good approach in Rosedale because we're getting regular data um, up to two updates a month, and the data will be coming in um, with very little lag. You know, it's important for the landowners to see and understand their water accounting during the irrigation season, not a year later if they're going to adaptively manage their water budget. Um, in addition to the remote sensing for water use measurement, um, we've also considered and used op other options, including flow meters and self-reporting by producers. Um, so we'll get into that later. In, in Rosedale, it is a, a satellite-based um, measurement, but there are opportunities to bring in multiple ways to account for the, the usage. Um, the next component to the accounting system is uh, the water supply. So we, we have the water use through the satellite-based measurements or other. The water supply is set by the district um, to establish an allocation or kind of you know, target usage for each field or for each landowner. The water supply can be made up of different types of water. Um, in, the, in the Rosedale cases, we see the bulk of the water is district project water that Eric is um, Eric and the Rosedale district are bringing in on behalf of the landowners and we're charging into the aquifer. But there's also other components to the water supply in Rosedale, precipitation, the native yield of the aquifer, and some others. Um, and we recognize that in other districts, the, the, the types of water that are relevant and how they're accounted for could vary. So the district would um, be responsible for entering the supply component of the water budget. And when we have both a, a supply and a usage, that allows us to create a water budget, uh, which we present to a landowner at the field and business or farm scale, and then roll that water budget up for reporting at the district scale or the regional scale. We provide landowner and manager dashboards to view and understand these water budgets. Um, the next component, once you've established an accounting framework, that's a, prereq a prerequisite for any potential trading program that you might want to consider. Um, landowners need to be aware of how their usage compares against a potential allocation and become comfortable with this foundation of accounting before trading can be enabled. Um, in Rosedale, we did conduct several landowner workshops where we held mock trading sessions and observed how folks were approaching the platform for usability, understandability of the platform, and we were able to adapt and refine the trading experience. Um, currently in Rosedale, they are in the phase of unveiling the accounting functionality to the landowners and considering moving towards an active live trading program but we wanted the ability to demonstrate the trading functionality to other potential users, other landowners and districts, 
So we have established um, for EDF a demo instance of the accounting and trading platform with trading enabled. And that's what I'll be demonstrating in a moment here for you to see. Um, and then the last important component of the platform is the ability to analyze the impacts of establishing an allocation of how landowners are choosing to use the water and then of the trading programs that move the water within a district or potentially across district boundaries. So to that end, we have uh, worked with Olson and um, Jim Schneider, who's one of our presenters today, to integrate a conceptual cloud-based modeling approach where we can actually execute mod flow models of a basin in a cloud environment and show the impacts on the aquifer to a groundwater manager like Eric. Um, so this component using the groundwater evaluation toolbox develop, developed by Olson um, kind of really takes the accounting and trading framework and turns it into a quantitative assessment of impacts to aquifer for, to the aquifer. For example, allowing understanding benefits and impacts of water usage for could a trading program result in better outcomes for a disadvantaged community, for example, if we're um, moving water within a district so that there's less usage in the vicinity of shallow wells that a, a community may rely on for their drinking water. And those types of scenarios can be analyzed in this platform through integration with um, cloud-based models. Um, so before I dive into the demo, one last thing to go through is we, we've established three sister platforms in the water accounting and trading family. Um, this was envisioned at the beginning by EDF as a way to take, take this investment and grow it and make it broadly applicable. So the first in the family is the Rosedale Rio Bravo water accounting platform, um, which is in usage today as a site for landowners to log in and see and understand their water budget. Um, the accounting comes first, the trading component is optional and, and may come later depending on what the district decides to do. Um, once we had built the Rosedale site, um, we recognized that we would want to be conducting outreach like this workshop. And so we have built um, an EDF demonstration site that Everyone on this call is welcome to sign up and use to create mock trades and have the experience of a landowner. The EDF demonstration site is based off of the Rosedale data, but the names of the individuals and the farms have been anonymized to protect privacy and the parcel boundaries have been tweaked just so that we in this demonstration site aren't um, exposing anything that, that a, a landowner or producer of the district might want to um, keep private. So we'll uh, be using the EDF demonstration site for our interactive walkthrough today. And then lastly, I wanted to draw attention to a, a platform that we built in the Upper Big Blue Natural Resource District in Nebraska. This was a project that Sitka and Olson partnered on where we didn't actually set out to leverage the work in Rosedale. Um, the framework in Nebraska, the regulatory framework is a little bit different. The Upper Big Blue NRD um, has a, a different type, you know, set of policies and a different set of goals in their platform. So we, we kind of set out to establish a uh, framework for allowing producers in the Upper Big Blue District to manage what they call their irrigation pools. And it was a great surprise in this project as we started to recognize, Jim Schneider and I, that the, the, the language was a little different, but the need was the same. And we actually pivoted this project for Upper Big Blue to bring in more and more of the Rosedale work and kind of sat back at the end and said, wow, we, we really built another element in this family. And that was kind of an eye opener to us to see how um, you know, from the Midwest to the West Coast, the, need, the needs are the same and the opportunity to share investment in a platform like this is very, very present. And we were able to deliver more features to Upper Big Blue than we really expected for a lower cost by bringing in the components that we started in Rosedale. So I'll, I'll do a, a short demo of the Upper Big Blue site as well uh, as I move into the interactive demo portion of the workshop. So I'm just going to pause the screen share for one moment while I set up my web browser. Okay. So 
best everybody can see the water accounting and trading platform in my web browser. Um, yep, we can see it, John. Thank you for the confirmation, Your Honor. Okay, so here I am at waterplatform.edf.org. This is a site that's available on the public internet that you all are welcome to visit at your leisure. Um, the EDF demo site is essentially a, a, a copy of the Rosedale site and the experience that I'm going to demonstrate today is one for one with what Rosedale's using, with the exception that we have enabled trading in the EDF demo site and that that would not be enabled in the uh, Rosedale site at this moment. So I've logged out of the platform. I was initially logged in with my own account. And I want to start at the beginning here, where I'm going to approach this platform as a landowner um, who, and we had a, a challenge that we've been working through with, with, with Eric and um, his, his staff member, Marcus at Rosedale, to figure out how are we going to bring in you know, hundreds or potentially a thousand landowners, producers, farmers in the district and get them up and running in this platform. and with their own landowner dashboard tailored to their farm and their um, parcels that they manage. So the, the way we're managing that is the district is actually sending out a physical piece of mail to all of the customers within their district, instructing them to come to the site, the Rosedale site, and create a user profile. First thing they need to do is set up a username and password like you would with any web application. So I'll go ahead and run through that process very quickly. Create a sign in, verify your email, enter your first and last name, and then the ubiquitous confirm you're not a robot. Once I create an account, I will receive an email asking me to verify that I have entered a valid email address. So, oops, that was not the right one. It looks like we've got someone signing up for the demo site. That's great. Just waiting for my email to come through here. Yeah, I've made a mistake. Kathleen, I, uh, I, I, one thing we didn't think through is that I, I need to enter a valid email address when I'm on the production site and the email. Oh, we didn't. One, one pitfall of doing a live demo here. So what I'm gonna do, um, thank you for bearing with me, is actually set up something that's gonna come to my email account. This is where my test of uh, thinking on the fly in a demo pays off. Okay. They say it wouldn't be a, a good live demo without one hiccup, and I'm glad I got mine out of the way on the uh, upfront account setup. But what it, to explain to everybody, I, I had entered a mock email address and I expected to be able to receive that, um, but it, it, in, in our in our practice run that came through and it didn't hear. So I had to send it to my personal email. Thank you for bearing with me. But I do get a link now saying, please come to click this link to validate your email address. Enter a username and password. And I'm in. Um, so once I'm signed into the platform, I get a notification saying, yay, you've logged in, but your account is not yet configured. Um, so what I need to do next is enter my account verification key. I'm presented with a disclaimer, just affirming that uh, the quality, you know, under a disclaimer about the data in the site and what the purpose is. I read and acknowledge the disclaimer. And now I'm prompted to enter my account verification key. This is something, as you can see in the image here, and the, the physical mailer that a landowner or a producer would have received with a license plate type code that they can enter to look up an account. 
And then I get a confirmation, confirmation message that my account was found. So we're hoping that this process of sending out the physical mailers, this is actually underway right now, will enable many, many landowners to get in and get their accounts set up without requiring a district employee to come in and, and manually link the user's username and password to their water account. Um, this is a, a, one way to get set up. Some users we recognize are gonna need some help from the district and, and ask a district staff member to get them set up. But for most users, the physical mailer will be sufficient to type in that verification key. The system then looks up the account associated with that verification key. And then I type in a digital signature to affirm that I can register for this account. And I'm in. Um, I have completed the sign up for the water accounting and trading platform. And I now have quick links on my dashboard to view my water accounts where I can see I have a single account cross crop farms that I'm associated with. Some users will have multiple billing accounts if perhaps they have two LLCs that they're associated with, or if a consultant were using the platform on behalf of landowners, they may manage multiple water accounts. Um, for this, I, am, I have a single account, but I would come to this page to view my accounts. I could, if I had another mailer come in, type in another verification key and get access to another account. And I also have the ability to invite any partners. If um, I wanted to bring in a business partner and give them access to the account or grant access to a consultant partner, I can control that myself here. Um, but the main thing for the landowners would be to click this landowner dashboard button where they come to kind of the most important part of the platform, the, the landowner dashboard, which is where a user would come to um, understand their water accounting. So I'm going to walk through this page. On the left, we have your water budget overview showing the number of acres managed and the number of parcels that make, make up that, uh, this water account. In this case, I have a single parcel with a, an APN number of 110 acres. If there were multiple parcels associated with cross crop farms, they would all be listed here. I have a water allocation of 400, approximately 400 acre feet. If I want, I can toggle the view from a volume measurement to a depth measurement. So 3.6 acre feet per acre, 3.6 acre feet of water available for cross crop farms. I can expand this to see the different water types that are configured um, and is relevant in the Rosedale um, district. The various water types we have are the project water, um, the native yield, which is the, uh, I'll go ahead and click this. This brings up a glossary where a landowner can come and understand the water types. The, the project water is the bulk of the water that's available to a landowner in Rosedale. It's the water that the district is purchasing and bringing into the district to recharge the aquifer. Um, there's also the native yield, which is the uh, groundwater that's available as, a, as an overlying right. Um, it's a smaller component in Rosedale. Um, the precipitation, <clears throat> the rainfall that occurs within the district and is uh, obviously available wherever it falls. The precipitation is brought into the platform automatically through an integration with the, the California Irrigation Management System, CIMIS. So that data is updated monthly um, as the, the, the precipitation occurs within the district. And then Rosedale also has two kind of uh, more unique water types, the reconciliation water, <clears throat> which is any of the project water that's not used in one year becomes, uh, is, is distributed to landowners who may have overconsumed. That, that's kind of a unique process to Rosedale. Um, and then finally, the stored water would be any water that needs to be accounted for that a landowner has required on their own through purchases or, or other means to acquire and recharge the aquifer. Um, so a landowner can see their total allocation and how that's made up of the various types of water. And again, these, these water types are, are configurable by uh, um, in, in the platform. So if the water types that are relevant in other regions, we expect, we know that these will vary and I'll show how those can be configured later on. Um, in addition to the allocation, we'll see what water may have been purchased or sold. 
And then the total water supply is your allocation plus what you've purchased and minus what you've sold. So in this case, Cross Crop Farms has that 400 acre feet because we haven't conducted any trades yet. Um, as of the end of October, Cross Crop Farms has used 150 acre feet. Um, and in a typical year, they're using about 160 acre feet. So the landowner in this case might look at their water budget overview. We also have a chart view here of the same data on a month by month basis. And Cross Crop Farms is going to look at this and say, boy, I'm using much less than I have been allocated. And if trading were enabled, this, this person at Cross Crop Farms might look at their water budget and say, I've got a lot of water that I'm not using. Perhaps I should consider marketing it. Um, I'll point out, in addition to looking at the current data, we also have the opportunity to look at historic years data going back to 2017, which is the uh, most recent data that the OpenET has available to us for, for water usage. So a landowner can come back and look at their historic years accounting as well. Scrolling down on the landowner dashboard, I can see, get that off the screen share. I can see water usage by parcel on a monthly basis. So if we had multiple parcels being managed in this account, you would see how the water budget for cross crops farms breaks down by parcel. And I can look at that in a tabular view in addition to a chart view. And then as a landowner, I would be able to see any trades I've completed or have in progress and a map of my parcels. I can click through and see some details of the parcel. I'll show that later. Scrolling up the page here. Um, that's the, the landowner dashboard, which is kind of the key functionality to understanding a landowner's water budget. Um, as we said, cross crop farms would be a candidate to sell some waters. They're, they're, uh, they have a, a greater allocation than what they're using this year and what they use in a, in a typical year where the gray line is showing the um, average consumption over all years. So this landowner might choose to go to the buy and sell water page. This is designed to be sort of a Craigslist style bulletin board where a landowner could come and advertise that they have water they would like to buy and sell and view other posters who have offered to buy and sell water. Um, in this trading instance, we're, we're relying on the landowners finding each other to buy and sell water through the bulletin board approach. We've seen other approaches that could include an auction or automatically matching buyers and sellers. And um, those are, are certainly interesting and could be potential future expansions to a trading program, but we wanted to really get kind of a simple landowner led opt in approach of um, creating a, a posting to, to buy and sell. Um, so let's go ahead and create a posting. So the landowner would come here and click a new posting. And uh, if you had more than one account, you could choose which account you're buying or selling from. In this case, I have a single account cross crop farm. So I'm going to go ahead and sell 150 acre feet because that seemed like a, a good a good amount of likely excess water I would have based on my water budget. And I'll offer that for $225 an acre foot. I have a, the ability to provide a, a description or a note on the posting if I so choose. Once I save my posting, it's then available on the bulletin board for other landowners to find. And at this point, I'm going to pause my screen share and let my colleague Kathleen take over, where she will act as a counterparty to this trade. Hi, everyone. Okay, so I've already logged into the platform and navigated to my landowner dashboard. Today I'm set up as a landowner for Hot Plant Farms. And as you can see on my dashboard, um, especially in the chart, I have over consumed my water budget. So I am looking to purchase some water to get back in balance. My current available is negative 78. There's still a few months to go in this water year. So I'm going to navigate to the buy and sell water page. 
and I am looking to buy water. So I can see a couple of offers to sell here. I can click on a posting. Okay, so this is an offer to sell. It's still open, 150 acre feet for 225. And I can see the note. Um, you'll notice I can't see the, the user who posted this, that um, the different user's identity is anonymous until we come to terms on the tree. So for my account, I can either take a couple of actions. I can either accept the offer as it is, or I can counter. I will counter because I only needed I have 78 acre feet, but I might use a little extra. So I'm gonna say 100 and I don't wanna pay 225. So I'll change this to 200. And I could add an optional note, but I, I won't do that today. So if I present this counter offer, it'll ask me to confirm. Once I confirm, a notification email has been sent to the other party that someone has countered and it's up to them to review my offer. So now I'll turn the screen share back over to John. Thank you, Kathleen. So as Kathleen noted, um, I now receive an email in my inbox noting that I have uh, received an offer on my posting and that I can then click the link to respond to this offer. And when I click that link, I'll go back in my browser here. I now receive a notification at the top of the page that there's an offer, a buyer is awaiting my response and I can respond to this offer. On my landowner dashboard, if I scroll down, I will also see the posting that I had made and the fact that there's a trade um, present. So just a reminder that that information is available on your landowner dashboard in addition to the notification I get at the top of the screen here. When I click respond, I'm on the trade page. I can see the history of the offer, my initial posting, that Kathleen gave me a counter offer. And then I have the ability to continue to negotiate. We can go back and forth until we agree to terms. I can reject the trade or I can accept. Rather than demonstrating a back and forth on the counter offer, I'll go ahead and accept this offer as presented. Once I click confirm, at this point, both Kathleen and I receive an email at where we our identities are revealed to each other. So the negotiation was anonymous until we have come to terms on quantity and price. And we now have been presented with each other's names and email address. And this was um, kind of by design um, for Rosedale, where Rosedale really wants to facilitate matching buyers and sellers, but not be a direct party to the transaction. Um, so they are relying on the buyer and the seller to um, close the contract and exchange the funds off system as a private party to private party transaction. But once that transaction has been agreed to, both the buyer and the seller must register the transfer. And so you'll receive an email notification asking you to close the deal and register, and then you're taken to the register transfer page. Um, in order to analyze and model the movement of water, we ask the landowners to specify which specific parcels they're intending to move water to or from. In the case of this demo, I only manage a single parcel, so it's um, there, there's not much to do here. But if I had a portfolio of parcels on this farm, I would be uh, choosing which specific ones I'm, I'm planning on um, including in the trade. I click Next. 
I read the legal description noting that the trade is um, irrevocable and that I'm directing the district to move the water from my water account to or from my water account. Um, and while I'm doing this, Kathleen, I type a digital signature. Kathleen is registering the trade as the other party. And once both parties have registered, the trade page shows the history, both the buyer and seller have registered. And I can then go back to my landowner dashboard and see that my water budget has changed as a result of this track transaction. And I now have 100 acre feet less available to me in the year 2020. And conversely, Kathleen has that additional 100 acre feet available to her. Um, and so next, uh, that was uh, the, the, the core of the accounting and trading um, for a landowner. And I'm going to sign out as a landowner and I'm gonna sign back into the platform and move on to demonstrating the manager's component of the water accounting and trading platform. So I'll click sign in. And now I'm gonna sign in with my typical work email where I will be configured as an administrator or a district manager in the platform. When you are a manager, you are directed immediately to your manager dashboard. And this looks a lot like the landowner dashboard with the exception of uh, it's a district wide view rather than a farm by farm or account by account view. So I see the total allocation across the district, both in depth or in volume, the total usage across the district and how that compares to historic average annual usage. And then the district wide view on in a, in a chart and as on the landowner dashboard, I can go back in time and look at the historic years. Other features of the manager dashboard, the account usage report shows all of the farms within the district. I can click through and view the, what the landowner would see for any one of these accounts. I'll note just quickly that the names we created in the EDF site, we found a fun little fake farm name generator um, to anonymize the landowner name. So these funny names like hot farm industries and farm bean industries, those were created by a, a machine learning algorithm to create some fun fake farm names for the anonymized platform here. Um, in the account usage report, I see the overall allocation to each account, how that is broken up by the various water types, project water, stored water, native yield, et cetera whether the landowners have purchased or sold any water on an account by account basis and then how much they have available. If a district were setting up a billing program or other accounting framework, you would download this account usage report to an Excel file, which could be used to generate any um, bills or overconsumption charges if that were relevant in a particular district. The manager also has an overview of all of the trade activity in the platform and a view of all of the parcels in the platform that are being managed within their district. Other components of the manager's experience include pages to view all of the users, where I can come in and see whether this user has active trades, whether they're buyers or sellers and assign their roles. Most of the users in the demo platform are our demonstration users for the attendees today, if you were to sign up, we can create assign you as a demo user role, which is like a landowner. Um, the difference between a demo user and a landowner is the demo user has view only functionality to the manager pages. But if this were not the demonstration site in the actual site, you would have a role of landowner where you wouldn't be able to see the manager pages. But in the demo site, we wanted to grant folks access to as much as possible so that you can see and understand the platform. I can click through on a particular user, manage their role, manually change what accounts they're associated with. For example, if I wanted to associate a user with an account, I could do so. I can come through and view all of the parcels within the district if I wanted to see and understand how a particular parcel, um, you know, who the owners are or where it is being, uh, For example, you can click on the grid or click on the map, click through to the parcel detail page. 
and just see information about the particular parcel, including which account it's associated with and then how the water allocation and usage and ownership history are being tracked for this parcel. We're setting up a process with Rosedale to refresh the parcel inventory on a periodic basis as parcel ownership change, changes hands or potentially the zoning or boundaries of a partial change due to land use actions. We know we need to keep that up to date via integrations with the tax assessor's record on the parcel inventory. So things like the bottom of this page where we see the ownership history, we recognize that in one year a parcel could be associated with landowner A, but it may be associated with a different account in a following year. And we wanna make that as easy as possible by leveraging the tax assessor's data to automatically update the parcel to account association with a new platform. A couple of pages in here to, uh, that a manager and administrator would use to um, set the water allocation. So on an annual basis, Eric or his designee would need to come in and say, how much project water are we acquiring and applying that on an acre basis to all parcels within the district. This will actually set the allocation and we, we've configured it so you can work ahead one year. You know, we'll, we'd be here in December of 2020, getting the platform set up for landowners in 2021. For certain types of water, rather than setting it on an acre by acre basis or a, a por proportional to the parcel area, um, we provide the ability to upload a spreadsheet where you would specify an APN and the amount of water for um, those types of water that may not be done on an area basis. The reconciliation water, this unique process to Rosedale is done. Um, you know, it, it can be analyzed in a spreadsheet and uploaded to set the, the reconciliation allocation. Um, I can configure the water types. Um, this is something that would only be done typically at the very beginning of establishing a platform. It, it, the, water, the water types could conceivably change over time, but they won't change very often. But this is just where I would come in and say, what are the water types that are relevant in my district, the project water, et cetera, and provide a definition for that would be available to the landowner to understand what does it mean to have project water as a type of water that's available to me. Um, and then lastly, there's a page to see um, how this platform is integrating with the OpenET platform to bring in the water usage. Um, a user could come here and check in on the status of the nightly synchronizations to bring in updated water usage as the accounting platform queries the OpenET platform to um, bring in that, that most current available usage. Um, the scenarios menu, Jim Schneider is going to talk a little bit about what we'll see here, but this is how the platform can integrate with models to inform management decisions. Um, some helpful pages under the learn more menu where you can understand more about how the water usage is measured with OpenET, view some frequently asked questions, a training video where a user might go to um, watch some, some videos we've recorded on how to use the platform. Um, so that is the main functionality I wanted to show you in the accounting and trading platform that we built for Rosedale and um, then the companion EDF demo site that we used for the demo. I'm also going to just quickly hop over to the upper big blue site that we built in Nebraska. And I just wanted to emphasize a couple of features of, about the upper big blue site that um, highlight kind of the similarities and the differences between what, what we saw in Rosedale. So at a glance, it, it, it's clear we're in a, a site that looks similar to the EDF demo site that I just worked, went through. Um, when, we, when we were asked, um, you know, we, we, we had an opportunity, Sitka Technology Group, to partner with Olson, um, exploring the, um, the, the, the scenario analysis in Rosedale and, and, and Jim Schneider saw the parallels to what was needed in, in Nebraska where he's based. Um, and we, we had set out not to bring the, the Rosedale work to Nebraska. We set out to kind of meet the needs of establishing irrigation pool management, not recognizing upfront how similar this was going to turn out to be to, to Rosedale. Some of the language is different um, instead of trading, they have pooling agreements. But as this project went on, both Jim and I were kind of light bulbs went off. We're like, oh, the component that we built in Rosedale, that I, I think Upper Big Blue needs that. And we brought more and more 
um, functionality over, I want to highlight both the similarities and the differences. One of the first differences is um, Upper Big Blue is not using remote sensing based data to account for their water usage. Upper Big Blue relies on an asset management system that they have called Beehive. And they use Beehive on a daily basis to track their inventory of wells, parcels, or, or tracks to use the language in Upper Big Blue, an inventory of the flow meters and the withdrawal events from those flow meters. So all of this data is managed in Upper Big Blue's established asset management system, and it changes on a daily basis. Um, but we needed this data in order to build out the water accounting component that Upper Big Blue needed. So we were able to integrate the water accounting platform with Upper Big Blue's asset management system, where every night the platform pulls in the latest updates to the well inventory and to the withdrawal events that the producers in Upper Big Blue are self-reporting. Um, so that ability to leverage the existing system that Upper Big Blue had and build that into the accounting platform um, was a great value and really set the stage for then um, bringing on the accounting components. Um, in Upper Big Blue, they have a concept called an irrigation pool. Rather than a water account that we showed in Rosedale, which is all of the parcels owned and managed by a single owner, in Upper Big Blue, the irrigation pool is the collection of bar parcels or tracks that share an irrigation source. So if I click through to an example irrigation pool, we see a page that looks a lot like the Rosedale's landowner dashboard. But as I scroll down to this map of tracts and wells, I can see um, a, what may be a more complicated scenario of various parcels potentially with different owners and several wells that are mapped. And any set of parcels that share owners or wells are lumped together into an irrigation pool. And the water usage is accounted for at the pool level um, because the wells can be shared across owners in, in this case. And we were then able to build out the ability to move water from pool to pool using what's called a pooling agreement. And a pooling agreement is analogous to a trade in the Rosedale platform, but has some different rules and different cases when it might be relevant. Um, particularly in Upper Big Blue, they will not enable pooling agreements until the aquifer level drops below a certain threshold. There's a trigger at which pooling agreements would become mandatory and then landowners would be required to um, manage to an allocation um, by conducting pooling agreements with their neighbors. Um, so we just wanted to draw attention to the, you know, the fact that our, our, our platform and this model of creating an open source um, system that could be shared has very quickly borne fruit in a way we did not expect um, through this work that um, Olson and, and, and Sitka partnered on in, in the Upper Big Blue District. So um, that I think is the key functionality I wanted to share in the interactive portion of the demo. I did see some questions coming through on the Q&A. Um, very tempting to dive into those as I go, but we're going to ask to hold those to the end. So I'm going to turn the demo at this point over to Jim to take on the screen share. And Jim's going to talk about how the platform can uh, take advantage of a cloud-based modeling approach. So I'll stop my screen share. Hi, Jim. I'm going to turn off my camera and turn it over to you. Okay, great. Are you seeing my screen okay? Yes, we are. Super. Thank you for, for that. So again, I'm Jim Schneider with Olson out of Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, and I'm going to uh, do a little deeper dive into the groundwater evaluation toolbox or, or get and talk a little bit about why we developed it and, 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 and a little bit more about, about what it is and, 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 and uh, show some of the uh, example ways that, that it can be used. Um, so I, I like to say that I'm a groundwater modeler by training and um, a groundwater or water manager a, a bit by accident. Um, I was hired by the Nebraska DNR to, to do groundwater modeling. Um, and I, I quickly, uh, within a relatively short amount of time, I, I, I was supervising 
the uh, water planning program for the entire state. Um, so I, I was in um, the situation of needing to um, manage this nexus between science and policy um, and um, very often find my, found myself uh, feeling like this guy right here um, and, and dealing with this love-hate relationship with groundwater models um, because they're absolutely necessary to, to manage groundwater, um, but they're inherently complex uh, and largely inaccessible. Um, and as a groundwater modeler, when I started to delve into policy, um, you know, I had no background in water management. So it took me many, many years of, of, of figuring out the, the water management side of it and the, the policy side of it. Um, and and even, even though we had, uh, you know, a, a, a whole division of, of staff that could, could do groundwater modeling and uh, related analyses, we, we still often found um, that we couldn't get the things done um, that we needed to do to, to manage water across the state. And we would really find ourselves in more of a triage mode in terms of, of going to the, the, the parts of the state that were having the, 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 the largest problems and, and just kind of hoping that, that uh, uh, things would stay quiet um, in, in other places. So um, what we really did in developing the groundwater evaluation toolbox is, is to bring automation technology to water management. And uh, th this is a, the assistant manager of one of the NRDs in Nebraska. And he's using one of the early prototypes of GET uh, there right in his office. Um, and so even though um, he, he has no background in groundwater modeling per se, although he understands what the model is for, um, he can ask questions um, related to different things they might do for water management um, and, and, and have the model return uh, results uh, in a way that are meaningful to him, uh, not just a, a, a bunch of uh, large binary files that, that he can't interpret. Um, and you can see there, uh, he's even doing it one-handed um, with one of his wrists broken. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> the idea behind GET is that, you know, as opposed to the traditional water, uh, groundwater study where a model is developed, some scenarios are run, a reports uh, created um, and, 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 and perhaps circulated. Um, you know, the idea is the models are, uh, remain readily available to both modelers and non-modelers alike and, and live on after that initial study um, and, 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 and are able to be utilized uh, for a wide variety of applications. And GED is highly customizable um, in terms of the, the, the types of applications uh, or questions that you might want to be able to evaluate uh, with your groundwater model. And then a really big part of that too is, is the visualization. Um, and I'll share a little bit of that um, with you here. But you know, to be able to, to, to see the results in, in meaningful charts and maps, um, it, it really in real time um, is, a big, is really a game changer in terms of understanding what's happening in the groundwater system and how the decisions that, that you're making about managing groundwater are going to affect the aquifer today and, and, and over the years. So uh, GET is a, a, a cloud-based platform, much like the, the water accounting and trading platform. So um, even though there's all these fancy uh, modules uh, that uh, allow for uh, GET to do what it does um, in the cloud, um, all you see is that, that, that interface uh, on your um, computer monitor and really all you need is, is a laptop, a browser and an internet connection and you can connect to your models. And here's just a, a, a few examples of, of some types of analyses that um, you might be able to do. And of course, today we're, we're focusing a little bit more on, um, on, on water trades. And I also have an example for um, tracking or managing um, potential managed recharge, um, but we can also, and, and, and have been using GET to look at long-term management of aquifer drawdown, um, areas that are seeing declines and, and what kind of reductions in pumping might be needed to, um, to slow those declines and eventually halt those declines and, um, uh, and looking at different timeframes for, for doing that. Um, and a really big use uh, behind, uh, uh, the development of GET in Nebraska 
was to look at groundwater surface water interactions because in, in Nebraska we have uh, a ton of groundwater about 2 billion acre feet in the high plains aquifer um, and, and that that aquifer uh, interacts uh, very directly with with all of the streams uh, that run through Nebraska um, and, and most of the pumping that that occurs in Nebraska doesn't really deplete the aquifer in any uh, meaningful sense but it instead depletes uh, those streams. Um, so that's a, a really key use uh, for the platform in Nebraska. So um, I just wanted to emphasize, GET is a standalone tool, and I'll show you that here in a minute. Um, so it can be used for any number of water management uh, decision support uh, applications. Um, and certainly we see uh, strong potential um, given the visualizations that are um, available uh, in GET for um, educating the public, showing, showing them the, 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 the stakeholders in a given area, um, you know, what's really happening when we, when we allow a new well or, or allow a trade um, or not allow a trade or a, a collection of trades. Um, but more, more and more, we're really seeing um, uh, GET also going into this direction of, of integration with broader platforms. So uh, of course, the example we're talking about here today is the Rosedale uh, and EDF water accounting platform. We're also actively working on uh, it, uh, uh, connecting it to uh, a, a, a groundwater manager's dashboard that we're developing for another NRD, the Twin Platte Natural Resource District in Nebraska. And so, um, you, you know, the, the, this, this, this water, groundwater manager's dashboard will manage all of their data um, and ultimately allow that data to be turned into uh, groundwater model scenarios. Um, and then the results of those scenarios to be visible uh, on the dashboard and, and readily uh, accessible for, for the managers in, in that way. So I'm gonna do a little bit of an interactive demo here. Um, whoops, gotta reshare my screen. Okay, I think I'm back. So the, this is the GET dashboard or, or, or uh, the, the, the GET um, platform. Um, and I've, I've started uh, the setup of a model, a model scenario um, just for the, the, the sake of, of time. Um, and I've, I've, I've set this scenario up with a name. I could give it a description if, if I chose. Um, and I chose the Rosedale Rio Bravo Water Storage District groundwater model, which you can see here, uh, uh, this black outline um, that runs around here. Um, and I've, I've used a scenario we call add a well because this allows us to um, add, add uh, points of extraction or points where we're gonna reduce extraction, um, which, which is the, the type of scenario I wanna do right now. So we've, just through, just through clicking on the map, um, and I, I activated the satellite imagery to help locate the, the, the parcels that I wanted to select. Um, I've dropped wells in at each of these locations. And um, well one, as you can see down here, uh, or this is well two, I should say, is a location where um, withdrawals are going to be reduced. So I've uh, put minus 10 acre feet per month or total of 120 acre feet in a year. And then we've added that pumping over here uh, at the location of well one. So once I've set that up, all I need to do is save the inputs and launch the run. And so now that model run is in, in the queue, in the cloud. Um, and when, get, uh, it, it, when the queue orchestrator wakes up and, and sees that a run has been ordered, um, it will launch that run, um, go through processing the inputs, uh, running mod flow, uh, running the groundwater model, taking the outputs and processing those, and then providing a, a, really, a really nice um, way to see the results within the dashboard. Um, but 
it, there's also the ability to send the results out through the, the API um, that, 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 that is uh, incorporated into GET so that we could see, for example, those the results of a run like the one I just did um, within a platform like the water accounting and trading platform. So that scenario is very similar to this water trading scenario that we've set up um, and conceptually integrated into the EDF water trading platform. And you can see water use was reduced in this location and increased in this location. And the nice thing about integrating with other platforms is we can bring in other data. Uh, within GET, we're really um, restricted to looking at the results of the model run within the, the, you know, the Google map um, that's there. But in this case, because we've integrated with the water accounting and trading platform, we've brought in data, for example, on the location of disadvantaged communities um, or private domestic wells that are shown by the green dots. Um, and so um, in this case, if, if a groundwater manager um, like Eric what wanted to uh, monitor trades and evaluate the um, effect on things like disadvantaged communities, um, whether or not that was going to be a, a proactive approval of the trade or, or, just, or simply a retrospective evaluation of, of what's, what's occurred um, and perhaps how that uh, might need to be reacted to, um, that, that can be uh, directly um, linked by, um, for example, when a trade gets um, agreed to by landowners, the platform would send the data associated with that trade to get and get would run the model and send data such as this back to the platform for a water manager to view. And then um, the other scenario that we've integrated in here um, is, is, is perhaps uh, more like how the water manager might react to that trade. Um, uh, in Rosedale, Eric has a, a lot of different ways that he can recharge the aquifer through all of their uh, various facilities. Um, and this, this scenario here shows how GET can be used to evaluate um, the uh, two potential uh, managed recharge scenarios. So if, if, uh, if there's a block of water that is available um, to, to the district and um, uh, Eric's considering where he might put that water within his system, um, I, there's various trade-offs. Um, uh, in terms of how to get the water to a given location. Um, but of course, one of the, the trade-offs that is really nice to be able to evaluate is how does that, that uh, recharge water um, percolate through the system and potentially um, perhaps offset some detrimental uh, or uh, yeah, detrimental effects of, of trades that have occurred in the past that, that you want to um, move on from. So, um, that's the, the, the scenarios that, that uh, John pointed out on the, the EDF uh, demo site um, and the conceptual integration of, of GET into uh, the, that water accounting and trading platform. I'm going to move on and cover one additional thing that, that John has talked about a little bit already. And, I just, and we really just wanted to emphasize um, that in accounting for water usage, um, we, we by no way um, are, are advocating for a specific approach. Um, you know, the, the, the point is that it's being done, not necessarily where the data is coming from. So, you know, uh, Rosedale is set up to account for their water usage uh, with OpenET, um, and, and that's how they'll be doing it. Um, but certainly um, direct measurement through flow meters is an option. And that is what um, the Upper Big Blue Natural Resource District does uh, to, to, to measure water. There's, there's trade-offs between these two, of course. Um, it, it, in, in the Upper Big Blue NRD, um, they were able to uh, require everyone to install a flow meter um, through the statutory, statutory authorities that the NRD had. So even though they have over 12,000 irrigation wells in that, in that uh, part of Nebraska, they had the authority to require a, a water user uh, to install a meter. Um, and, and then um, 
because they have so many wells, um, the, the, the process of actually going out and reading all those wells, which is, is done in some parts of Nebraska by the natural resource districts, um, but uh, would be a, a, a daunting task for uh, the upper big blue NRD. So they combine uh, direct measurement with self-reporting. So there's a, a portal that um, is associated with Beehive that John talked about. Um, and, and, and every year, every user is required to go out and read their meter and log into that portal. And for each one of their wells, um, they report their water use. And before they had meters, um, they uh, used a process of estimating their water use um, based on uh, precipitation, I believe. Um, and uh, that, that was how they uh, initially did that when they first required um, self-reporting of water use, um, but before the, the meter order took effect. So there's certainly any number of ways of getting this water usage data. Um, it, it's just a matter of, of selecting the, the most appropriate um, and cost-effective um, way for any given area and, 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 and implementing that. So that wraps up my part of the presentation and I will turn this back to John. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> so I am reestablishing my screen share here. So. Thanks for bearing with me, almost there. Okay, um, we are back up into the PowerPoint and the next section of the agenda is looking forward to the second workshop. So as Christina mentioned at the beginning, we've got to have a series of three workshops planned and um, you might ask yourself, what makes this a workshop instead of just a presentation? And, and, and you've got me, workshop one is really us giving you information, but um, we're looking forward to setting up a, a second workshop that we are going to create breakout sessions is the plan where we can get together with smaller numbers of users and actually have more of an interactive discussion on what this platform, these platforms and this technology can become. Um, the features that we've showed with the water accounting and trading platform are, are available for others to take and expand upon. And um, the, the, the GET platform is, is available, or will be available via you know, a, a license with the Environmental Defense Fund to make that available to other users as part of a, kind of a, a, a solution that can grow beyond the Rosedale region like it grew to Nebraska. So we're hoping um, after this first workshop to set up a series of breakout sessions that we will establish with the folks who are, who are on the call today, on the presentation today, and where we can help establish a roadmap for the platform, gathering insight from you on what is similar and what is different to the Rosedale and Upper Big Blue use cases so that we can establish a, that roadmap for um, future functionality to make this as broadly applicable as possible. Um, so the second workshop will be a breakout session um, with a smaller number of attendees. We're hoping maybe four to six or eight attendees per breakout session. And uh, the third and final workshop will be a synthesis of what we learned in the breakout session and how that translates to a platform roadmap. Um, so how are these breakout sessions going to work? Um, what we're gonna do is ask everybody who's on the presentation today to fill out a two question survey to describe how you might identify with a user of the platform. And to do that, we've identified this, there's a concept in systems design of a persona, which is the, the archetype or a character that represents a potential user of a platform. And we wanna design the platform roadmap to meet the needs of these particular personas who the, who the platform should support. So we have identified a preliminary list of personas that we, we think and hope would represent everybody who's at the, the workshop today. Um, the producer and the landowner being kind of first on the list as we're really looking to build a, a landowner centric platform, but also the groundwater managers, um, regulatory staff and elected officials and their staff 
um, groundwater modelers and consultants, scientists and academics, um, data managers, GIS type folks, maybe within an agency, um, NGO partners like Christina, and then any interested community members um, are the types of users who can receive value from the platform that we've demonstrated. So we're um, hoping to set up these breakout sessions where we'll get together groups of, of like personas to um, first make sure we understand the persona accurately and we have a good definition of, of what that persona is. And then to start developing user tasks that are relevant. And these are, these are statements of the form as, as a blank, I want to blank. As a landowner, I want to have confidence that I can continue to run a sustainable business um, in the context of Sigma. Or as a regulator, I want an easier way to roll up my, the water budget for my district so I can put that out in my annual report. As an academic, I want to be able to weigh in with confidence on how a groundwater model is used to inform management activities. So these are some examples of kind of high level user tasks that we're looking to first inventory and then prioritize. Um, and having this opportunity to bring in smaller working groups of folks to build out and prioritize the user task list will then inform the platform roadmap and allow you to influence the platform roadmap in a way that um, could help you see yourself and your region or your specific needs in um, future iterations of the platform. And then um, lastly, we'll be inventorying the types and the quality of available data that you might provide or use in one of these breakout sessions. So I do want to note that we're, we, we're, you don't have, we're, we have a recording of this presentation. So if you know somebody who you think might be a good participant in one of these breakout sessions, please share the recording um, so that they can have a sufficient background on this technology to effectively participate in the breakout session and then um, you know, spread the word. Um, so in order to build these breakout sessions, we wanted to ask everybody to, um, if you're willing, fill out a short survey. Um, I am going to just hop out of presentation mode so I can copy the URL to that survey and put it into the chat. And I'm hoping folks might be willing to take this survey. It should only take two minutes while we are um, in the, the presentation session here. So I will paste this into the chat. We'll send it to all the panel, all of the attendees. And y'all should have just gotten that link. And what I'm gonna do to encourage you to fill out the survey is I'm gonna fill it out myself. So you have exactly enough time right now to copy and paste that survey. And um, what are we asking you to do here? I'll breathe for a moment, have a sip of water while y'all load up your browsers with that link. You of course don't have to do it at this very moment, but we thought it was since it's so short, we would just uh, encourage folks to get it out of the way, but you're certainly welcome to do this later. All we're asking to understand is which of the following personas do you most identify with, you know, we're hoping that, there, that you can choose one primary. Some of you might cover both. If we happen to miss you, I'm sorry. <laughs> we tried to be comprehensive, but we recognize we may have missed um, somebody. And if we did, please let us know. And then um, we'd like you to let us know if you're interested in participating in a breakout session. Even if the answer is no, it would be helpful for us to understand which persona you're in. Um, but please you know, feel free to, to say, yes, I'm very interested. We'll certainly send you an invite. If you're maybe, we, we can reach out and talk more about if, if and how you'd like to participate and um, no hard feelings if the answer is no. Hey, John, do you want to try copying that one more time into the chat? Because a lot of people said they can't seem to copy it from ah. the chat. Wonder why that would be. Well, we can know. certainly. Um, so we'll, Paul, we'll send it out again when we. We'll send everyone a note afterward, and we'll include it there too. I am sorry oh. for that. I thought we were yeah, it's to not start. a live link, John. So I think people need to highlight the text and then press Control C instead of 
it's not an active link. Okay. So, mm -hmm. Oh, but so, they're saying we'll send an email afterwards with the link yeah. if people are having. Yeah, maybe that's a security feature in Zoom, so I don't send you all to a spam site or something. But Kathleen, um, oh, people are having more success now, John. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it could be it could be an idiosyncrasy of, of individual Zoom installs, but Jack is telling us that's highlighting it and hitting Control C worked for him. Um, okay, so now we're getting some success. All right. Just one more time, just in case. All right, well, I know, uh, thank you for that feedback. I, I know y'all are trying and that's a success. That's engagement, thank you. <laughs> um, so we're getting ready to move into the, the Q&A session of the, of the workshop here. Um, I just wanted to, while folks are filling out the survey, um, just make a, a, a closing remark on the presentation portion, which is, um, you know, we're really interested in building a user community around this technology. And that was kind of key to EDF's vision when they started, and, and Rosedale's vision when they started partnering on this, um, was to, to make what we're building in one place, make those investments broadly applicable. And so we, we have, I think you've seen through this demonstration, built the platform not just to meet Rosedale's needs, but to meet Rosedale's needs in a way that is versatile and extensible. And it is available without a, 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 a software subscription license. That there's, um, there's a, this AGPL3, this is um, a, a, a technology license that says that, that what we've built can be built upon by anybody. Um, if you're a larger agency and you have your own development staff, you can do that. Um, if you want to work with somebody other than Sitka, you could choose to do that. If you wanted to work with us, that would be great too. But the, it, it's baked into the licensing terms of the technology that you can do with this what you want. And that is intentional to encourage adoption because the more people who use technology, the cheaper it becomes for everybody and the more useful it becomes for everybody. And that's just fundamental to this model. Um, and how you might leverage the platform. If your use cases are very similar to Rosedale's use cases, you've got a really strong starting point and it may not cost a lot to get it going. If you need to customize it to meet your own specific use cases, that's totally possible. And you can even self-manage and host this if you so chose, I think. Um, and then lastly, in terms of scaling and onboarding, um, yeah, it, 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 sm from small to large agencies and it, it, the, the, the platforms available. And if we are able to build a user community, the possibilities for roll-up reporting across districts and across geographies um, really starts to become powerful. That as, as other districts neighboring Rosedale might adopt the platform, we can start to imagine roll-up reporting at the aquifer regional scale in addition to the, uh, the individual district scale. Um, so we're, we're, we're hoping that this has piqued your interest and you might consider becoming part of the user community of this technology ecosystem. And if you are interested in learning more about this, um, we do invite you to create accounts and experience the landowner dashboard and the trading functionality in the EDF demo platform. If you do sign up and create an account, we'll associate you with your, with your water account so you can go in and play around. Um, EDF has produced a really wonderful Esri story map that kind of takes this <laughs> one hour long demo and distills it into a very visual, 10 minute experience. I just really love what we EDF has done with the story map. So I encourage you all to take, take a look at that. And then if there's any um, fellow nerds on the call who are interested, um, the, the underlying source code for the accounting and trading functionality um, is available uh, for anyone to take a look at. Um, so with that, I think we can move on to the um, Q&A portion of the workshop. Thanks so much, John and Jim, for the excellent presentation. Um, I'm really excited for the Q&A session. We have tons of questions coming in. Um, and I took a shot at organizing some of the questions. Um, so let's just see how that goes. Um, and in, in kind of being recognizing we only have 30 minutes, what I might do is just ask all the panelists to come back on. Um, if you can turn on your screens, that would be great. So we can have a little bit of a discussion 
And I'm going to try to target some of the questions to specific people. Um, but if there's something that you need to add, please go ahead and do that. And then we've also asked um, one of our EDF uh, colleagues, Dana Rollison, to join us. And she's um, been working really closely on leading the Open ET pro uh, project. So if you have questions on that, we can also ask her to weigh in. So the first set of questions um, you know, that I'm going to dive into are really coming in around the allocations. Um, and so there's questions in terms of, you know, one, and this is going to be for Eric, how did you, um, how do you calculate project water? And then a second question is, well, go ahead and answer that. And then I'll, I don't want to ask you to remember too much at once. Sure. So um, very simply, project water is based on a 20 year running annual average of the water supply that the district has had available. Um, and so what we do is we take a 20 year picture drop, you know, as we advance to the next year, we drop one year off and we pick up the new year, but it's based on that running annual average. Thanks, Eric. And, you know, I think in terms of the allocations, I, I, and it's kind of been covered a little bit already, but the allocations are really up to the districts and, and the district stakeholders to develop and, and obviously kind of recognizing and respecting some of the, the groundwater rights and laws. And so that's not something this platform will necessarily help you solve in terms of what those decisions are, but it is a tool to help familiarize people with allocations, make that more um, easy for the landowners in the district to understand and to track that through time um, and facilitate those conversations. Um, and then another question is, uh, does water get allocated to total parcel, parcel acreage or just irrigated acreage? Does acreage under residential areas, roads, shops, et cetera, get included in an allocation? Yeah, so very quickly, um, the allocation looks at the acreage, but I will say that we exempted um, all lands that are zoned commercial or residential. And so what that means is, is that um, those types of, of lands that are zoned to those uses don't have a water budget. We just basically provide whatever is needed. Uh, for those that are on um, agricultural parcels, uh, their allocation is based on acreage, which does include um, non-irrigated components such as roads or shops and those types of things. Perfect, thanks, Eric. And then we have a question coming in from Oregon um, saying that Oregon may require that a portion of any water savings be dedicated to the state for augmenting stream flows. I assume the application could be easily modified to recognize such a cut for the environment. And I'll, I'll take a first stab at that and say, yes, I think it's up to, you know, those who use the platform to kind of decide, decide what those allocations look like. Um, but I'll turn it over. I don't know if anyone else from, from the panel has something they'd like to add to that. Okay. Um, and so then we get, we were getting some questions on in regards to allocations and stored water and how that's tracked. Um, so I'm gonna read this question. Um, in terms of stored water, the, the goal is to accumulate stored water, water banked for future drought years. As a grower, I like to meet um, environmental sustainability goals um, for my corporate clients. The ability to bank water, protect my crops for low surface deliveries during a five-year drought period on-farm recharge is also known as flood mar, where we can add winter excess water to our field for growing recharge. And so I guess, you know, there's a question in terms of how does stored water come into play into this platform um, in terms of on-farm recharge or, or, or other activities? So I'll, I'll maybe start, but then certainly let John um, step in because he had to program this accommodation. Um, so there's a number of different line items in the accounting platform. For example, precipitation, native yield or safe yield, what we call project water, which is the water the water district provides uh, primarily from surface supplies. Um, and then there is what we call a stored water component. And that water is water that the landowner may develop or acquire outside of the district. And that water can be stored into future years. But the water that the district provides, we call project water, cannot be stored or carried forward um, because that's part of um, what we do is at the end of the year, if there's unused water, then that landowner um, releases it, if you will, and it's reallocated um, to meet any um, 
uh, offsets or, or uh, need. Um, and so that's that's currently how we're structured. But you know, there's a lot of policy issues surrounding a lot of this. And so um, you know, we uh, that's our initial approach, and, and I'm sure it'll be revised over time. So John, I don't know if you have anything else. To yeah, that, that th thanks, Eric. Um, you know, we, we, we programmed the platform in, in terms of the rules around stored water according to Rosedale's requirements. Um, but, and as Eric said, those are set by the, the, the policy and the board decisions. But if you're within a region um, that allows carrying over unused water under a different set of policies or rules, um, adapting the, the, the carryover rules in the platform to allow you to bank water and for future drought seasons is absolutely something that would be accommodated by the very, you know, defining the right water type and then setting up the right carryover rule. So it, it, it fits within the platform, even though your use case is a little bit different than the way Rosedale and Eric are, um, these rules are set up. Perfect, thank you. And I wanna acknowledge this question. I think it, it ties in um, to the discussion we just had, um, but is there a lost term for stored water does it flow away if left unused for several years? You know, and I think the first part of that question, it, it kind of de is determined by the policies that are set up with the district. And a lot of those policies are really tied into how you can use and design the water accounting and trading platform. And then, you know, I also think, you know, we're working with Rosedale right now, but one of the reasons that we made this open source is really to maybe be able to scale some of those management actions and decisions to kind of evaluate what this looks like over a larger landscape and better be able to determine what those beneficial uses may be or kind of where those protections need to be put in place. So I don't know, um, wanted to acknowledge that question. Does anyone have anything else they'd like to add or maybe we sufficiently covered it? Uh, maybe maybe just to add one thought. Um, the, the reality is, is that that stored water does migrate. We, we're, we're in a very dynamic part of the basin. Um, and I, I've heard that some areas are adjusting their stored accounts to reflect that migration. Um, that's a reality, and, and maybe this kind of helps under, helps helps explain why Jim's tool is so valuable. That is a reality of temporal and spatial issues, but it doesn't address the reality of ownership. And um, and, and we're going to learn more as we as we move forward into this, but that's where Jim's tool, I think, is very helpful if we can evaluate the impacts associated with that type of pumping in an area that, frankly, my water does migrate beyond my, my capture zone, but that doesn't mean that I don't have a right to pump it. I just need to be very aware of the impacts associated with that pumping. Perfect. Thanks, Eric. And so the next question, um, we'll also go to Eric, and it's, are there operating and maintenance and other district charges charged to the buyer um, during, and, and that's, you know, focused on the, the trading portion of the platform. And then I, there's a second part of the, the question, which I think Eric, you'll probably understand maybe better than I do. Is the water price the premium or the out of the meter price, maybe? Um, so hopefully I answer the question. <laughs> Uh, so we actually don't, so the district has an assessment and it is a per acre assessment that is charged to all users, irrespective of the, the amount of water used. Um, and to the extent that, uh, we have an adequate water supply to meet those consumptive uses, um, there's no need for an additional charge. We have, um, kind of on hold what we call the water charge which is available to the district to levy to those that exceed the, the allocation and or the water that's available through that reconciliation process that I mentioned before. Um, but that, that charge um, is basically the cost of service, if you will, heavily subsidized by other programs within the district. It, it actually is substantially lower than the actual cost of service, but um, be that as it may, we don't set pricing for purposes of the market transactions, uh, we are very much hands off. Um, those will be negotiated between buyer and seller. And hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, and if for some reason you need clarification, you can go ahead and uh, type in another question or, or response into the chat um, and Rana will help track that. Um, and this is, a, I think, a straightforward question to John. Uh, what is the time frame for water hitting the buyer's account? The time frame for water hitting the buyer's account. Um, the 
water is accounted for on an annual basis in Rosedale. And so the, 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 the water allocation is um, you know, moved from the one account to the other account at the time both parties register with the district. So there, there isn't a physical movement of water in the Rosedale case. The water is um, withdrawn from the aquifer as, as used by the irrigators, but the, the accounting is updated at the point of registration. Yeah, and that, that once both trades are registered, buyer and seller, it's, it's pretty much automatic that you'll see that then into your account. Um, That's right. And then there's a couple of questions around, um, are there mechanisms in the trading platform to ass assess adverse or positive impacts of a, of a trade to you know, communities or disadvantaged communities and, and wells or groundwater dependent ecosystems? And, and some of these questions might have come in before we did the GET demo, but I just wanna acknowledge that you know, one of the, really, the, the reasons that we're so excited to partner with Olson is because these scenarios allow you to recognize what you know these beneficial actions or results or potential impacts could could look like into the future and it can help you plan and inform trading rules or evaluate you know management actions through time beyond you know for example just trading and at larger scales so eric could use this you know within the district or you could even use it within the larger kern basin um, so i don't know if if jim or, or others um, have anything to add to that but hopefully um, you enjoyed the kind of the scenarios portion of the, the workshop. Yeah, I don't think I have anything to add um, given that. The, the okay, question. perfect. Um, and then uh, another question, and I just want to, some of these are a little bit repetitive, but I want to, you know, acknowledge the questions that came in and kind of make sure we answer them. Um, but this question is kind of, can you set a limit um, on areas for, for allowing trading um, for example, living for trades between confined and unconfined aquifers or based on a geographical boundary preventing trading from areas of severe cones of depression. Um, yeah, that, that is a really a good and interesting question. And it's part of the reason we're looking to establish these breakout sessions is that we, we recognize that Rosedale was a bit of a, a soft launch, an easy launch because the aquifer is, is simpler and the policies are simpler and that we expect to run into um, policy issues and, and physical constraints on what water can be traded. Um, within Rosedale, it, the, the, the hydrology of the aquifer is a little bit simpler than in, southern, in some areas and the water is only being traded within the district, within that aquifer. And as we move into other areas that, that are maybe more complicated, we expect to have to wrestle with these questions. And the truth is, I, I don't know how we're going to answer them. And that is, um, you know, why we've set up part of the reason we've set up this workshop series is to, to dive in to these um, more complicated scenarios around um, trading water rights or actually physically moving water if that comes in. And so I, I partly say there's a, an ask to engage in dialogue on that rather than a direct answer to the question, but Eric, Eric or Jim might be able to go further in terms of directly answering the question. I could just say from, from the Nebraska perspective, uh, the, the NRDs have, have had to implement a number of policies like that. You know, they have management areas where you can't move water, move water into, um, for example. And one of the big, thing, big considerations, as I indicated, is surface water, groundwater interaction. So that is, is usually a very significant um, constraint on the ability to, to trade or transfer water use um, because they want to, they, in many, many cases have to um, ensure that, that a trade won't increase the impact of uh, that water use on, on stream flow. And so um, if you trade water from far away from the river to closer to the river, what you get uh, at the location you trade it to is a lot less than what you gave up. So there's Perfect. a discount Thank you. to these unfavorable trades to right. mitigate for impacts. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, kind of moving along, we're getting some questions around uh, water rights and water law and recognizing that we don't have any attorneys on the, on the panel. I'm going to uh, defer asking those questions, but I will give a plug to 
uh, a law review article that EDF um, just published in the UCLA of, um, Environmental Law and Policy Journal um, with a couple of prominent California attorneys um, that looks at allocations under stigma and talks about some of those legal concerns and issues. And I think Rana is gonna put a link in the chat to that in case anyone wants to, to check that out. And so the next question um, is, does the platform have a billing module? And then how would the platform interact with legacy billing software if a district GSA already has one? Yeah, so there, the, 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 the platform supports the billing calculations through the table on the manager dashboard that shows the, the overall water accounting, but we're not turning that into something that actually issues invoices or even calculates the dollar value of that invoice. For the Rosedale case, you know, um, they have their own accounting software and the analysis that can be done, can be done in Excel to, to populate the accounting software. We talked early in the project about having kind of a direct integration with accounting software. You know, I, I think Eric said that, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, that you use QuickBooks for that. Um, we're certainly interested in exploring data integrations with, it, with actual accounting software, but at, at the moment we're just facilitating the invoicing through you know, providing the, the available data, but not actually doing the integration. Certainly something to consider for the roadmap. Perfect. Anyone else have thoughts to add? No? Okay. Um, a question for Eric. What is the actual role of a manager? Is the district manager um, the, or the platform manager, you know, are, is there a dis distinction between these roles? And can a user see all of the transactions done in the platform? Um, well, my, my, my role as manager changes day to day. But uh, <laughs> as far as um, my role as it relates to the platform, um, it's really just to um, monitor the transactions, um, make sure everything is working, be responsive to landowner issues or concerns or questions. Uh, but the platform really is kind of standalone and it doesn't require much from me um, in the way of administration. Um, as far as, there was a second part to the question, and I'm sorry, I'm looking over here on the right. What was the second part of the question, Christina? Yeah, the second part just uh, gets at who can see what um, oh, in the platform. Right. So what can you see versus your landowners? Um, so as, as a manager, I, I do see all of the transactions, um, but I, and I apologize if John covered this, um, much of, so what I will see is ultimately the, the folks that are listing as buyers or sellers. Um, but once they've basically made connection or, or contact and have begun the negotiation, that is not done on the platform per se. There may be some chat, but ultimately there's going to be an agreement that's developed and executed between those two landowners that the district does not need to be privy to. Um, once they've executed and, and in effect consummated their agreement, then they go back into the platform to confirm the transaction and the platform will register that um, and uh, incorporate that, that transfer, if you will, from the seller to the buyer. Um, and uh, that should happen behind the scenes. Um, and, and ultimately the, the landowner information is, is relatively confidential, um, but they do have the ability to post some of that. And the district will, um, to the extent the information is available, make that information available, um, whether it's in a, a summary of the transactions or the amount of water that was traded, or even in some cases, they may disclose pricing. And I'll, I'll just add to that, that um, landowners can't see another landowner's information, that they're segmented only to those accounts they're authorized to view. Um, there's a so and then on the roles there's an administrator role in the account that I have as kind of part of the system development team and Eric also has that role in the future we might want to differentiate like the groundwater manager Eric from the platform administrator me as the functionality grows and maybe Eric doesn't want to worry about the status of the open ET integration for example we, we can build more segmented roles but Right, right now there's there's just in the Rosedale, there's a landowner and there's an administrator. And those are the two roles that the platform needs at this stage 
um, the EDF site introduces a third role, the demo user who, who has all of the landowner experience but can see some of the features that an administrator can see. Thank you. And so I think uh, the next question, um, and then I want Dana and maybe to come on and maybe you can share, uh, turn on your, your microphone because um, we're gonna get into some of the ET, open ET questions here. But in the meantime, this question is for you, Eric. How is the water account for individual farms estimated? Um, how is the water for individual farms estimated? So um, each, each landowner has their, their water budget dashboard, if you will. And what, what happens is when they log in, I had mentioned the different components. So let's say that they're one acre uh, of land they'll receive their proportionate share of the district's water supply as project water. And right now it's about 2.7 acre feet per acre. So they'd get a, a line item, 2.7. And then um, they would have credit for the precip that was measured at a, I think it's Shafter station. Um, and that information, John's been able to connect that in so that it's pretty much real time as the precip comes in that the, the uh, account reflects that and updates the, uh, the information. Um, they receive their pro rata share of the native or safe yield that's been uh, developed and, and agreed within the basin. So that would be 0.15 acre feet per acre. And so all of that, think of that as their revenue part of the budget. Or if they have any stored water, that's also available to them. And then on the demand side of the budget is the open ET information that measures the evapotranspiration and basically adjusts or begins to debit um, their account, if you will. Um, and so that's kind of the different components. It, it, it's basically every January, the water district goes in and makes a deposit of project water. As precip comes in, that's kind of like a revenue stream. Um, the native yield will be there as well. Um, and then consumptive use is their debits, if you will, as, as time marches through. But all of that information is updated and put into the, the platform, um, either by the district in January or by the remote sensing information that's available to us through the Simis station or the Open ET. Perfect, thank you. And then Dana, if you have, want to weigh in as well, and then there was a question in, in terms of the level of accuracy. So maybe if you have anything to expand on from what Eric already said, and then if you could talk about the level of accuracy for the Open ET data. Yeah, I know that was a great summary, Eric. Um, and I guess just building on that, um, the for the Open ET component, um, we've built an API and application programming interface that um, co connects directly uh, through the back of the portal with the SIDCO website and basically pulls um, the ET data. Right now it's um, historic monthly, but um, at, you know, as we get closer to you know, full incorporation and launch, it'll be near real time pulling all of that data. And it, the ET data basically provides um, rates in depth such as millimeters per month. And then that can be expressed in units of feet multiplied by the number of acres being irrigated to get to that acre feet water consumption. So that's sort of how it works on the back end. And in terms of accuracy, um, we're currently conducting the largest um, accuracy and in inner comparison study um, of any you know, ET data. Uh, and what we found at this point, what we're in phase one right now, and our initial comparisons with um, over 130 ground base stations um, is plus or minus 10% for better accuracy uh, across all of irrigated ag, which we're really excited about. And uh, we'll finish phase two of the inner comparison, which is um, kind of a secondary blind comparison with the second half of ground-based um, measurements uh, that we haven't released to the team in January. And um, we'll calculate the final ensemble value based on that. But um, we, we can safely say that among irrigated ag, um, we're expecting 10, plus or minus 10% accuracy or better. Perfect. Thanks so much for uh, your willingness to weigh in there, Dana. And then I'm gonna put Jim on the spot for the next uh, couple of questions because they're coming in um, in regards to GET. And Jim, if you could talk about how the data is collected and is it dynamic from a well drawdown standpoint? Well, the data that, that goes into GET is basically whatever whatever data the groundwater manager has. Um, typically, um, you know, 
what, what these scenarios are are just kind of future projections um, that, uh, that, that inform uh, decision making. Um, so that, that's kind of what the kind of the initial use case for, for, for GET was um, envisioned to be, but it's, it's, it's expanding to be, um, to, to be more um, uh, real time in terms of mo uh, you know, updating models um, and comparing you know, actual predictions with, um, what, what, with observations um, as, as, as uh, you know, in, in, in more real time. So um, I hope that answered the question. Okay, and this question might allow you to dig in a little deeper. Um, with many potential transactions and modeling scenarios, how can all of this be calibrated in the model to verify the integrity of modeling results over time? Sure, yeah, so I can, I guess, expand on that. I mean, that, this is kind of the, the, gets to the heart of what we're doing with this twin plaid NRD uh, project that I, that I referenced earlier. Um, you know, they're, they're collecting uh, near real time water use data um, from the standpoint of gross pumping. Um, and and our, our plan is to integrate the open ET evapotranspiration data along with, um, you know, parcel based precipitation data from, from, um, you know, sources like PRISM or GridNet um, and, and really to do a, a water balance um, on a parcel by parcel basis um, across about 320,000 irrigated acres uh, in, in, that, in that natural resource district. And by doing that, um, we'll be able to, you know, update the, the groundwater model with, you know, current data, you know, whether it's monthly or annually, um, and at the same time, they're installing a lot of automated um, equipment uh, in, in, in the field, um, such as water level um, uh, measurements and other verification um, devices, such as flow meters. Um, so you know, bringing all of that together, um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, really big. We're, we're kind of in uh, the middle of year two of, a, of, of that four year project. Um, but bringing it all together and, and, you know, more than just letting the model live, live on from, from a use, usability standpoint, but actually breathe life into the model um, and, and have a, a, a platform. Um, we're using uh, GeoOptics, a platform developed by Sitka uh, to manage all of the data. Um, and then that will be connected with, with GET and with, with some other cloud-based platforms um, to to integrate all that data into one location so that we're actually, you know, simulating what, what, what we think is going on and being able to um, look at, you know, in near real time, what's, what's actually going on and compare the two. Perfect, thank you. Um, we have a question about ownership. So what if land ownership changes, you know, management may or may not change, how is this handled within the platform? So I can take that one. Um, the relationship between a, a, an owner and a parcel is derived from the tax assessor's data. And that we're just, we're, we have a process where that can be updated annually or more frequently to kind of reassign those parcels to their new owners. Or if a new owner appears in the tax assessor's data, they would get an account created and ready for them to log into. Um, we are expecting Rosedale, the district, to update from the tax assessor's data on an annual basis. Um, if there are changes to ownership, you know, there will be changes to ownership, of course, on an ongoing basis throughout the year. Um, those would be need to be need to be captured manually by a district staff member, an administrator in the platform who would go in and move the parcel from landowner A to landowner. So there's a little bit of a lag there that it would require if it's a mid-year update and a landowner wants to see that reflected in the platform, they need to essentially inform the district that a sale has occurred and ask them to please update the account. If they don't reach out and ask, it'll get captured in that annual update. So kind of a two-pronged approach, um, a landowner initiated approach mid-year and then a district led approach at the end of the year to update with the latest assessor's information. John, do you want to talk about how the Upper Big Blue platform gets updated, or I could? Um, yeah, I'll, I, I'm happy to, but I'll, I'll defer to you on that. Go ahead. Um, okay. Within the Upper Big Blue platform, there is the integration with their asset inventory um, that is 
updated and maintained by district staff. So if they change, if the ownership record changes within the asset inventory, that they're kind of have folks who, who do maintain that um, on, a, on a regular basis that automatically is reflected in the platform because they, they had that kind of other enterprise data source in their Beehive application or Beehive asset management software. Um, did, I, did I cover that how you would, Jim? Yeah, it, up, it, it updates every night, right? It, it updates every night. Um, it does rely on a, on a district staff member to you know, make the change in, in the asset management system, but they do keep that up reg very up to date and it would be reflected in the accounting platform the next day if they make the change within the asset management system. Perfect. Um, well, I'm going to finish with one kind of last like group of questions and I want to recognize that I apologize we're not going to get to all of the questions, but um, we do have a record of those questions and if you want to reach out to um, anyone on this email, maybe we can, I don't know if it's possible, I don't want to put anyone on the spot, if you could just put up contact information, that last slide of the presentation with everyone's email, um, feel free to contact any of us with questions. But in the meantime, the last uh, kind of group of questions I want to pull together are talking about, you know, how, who's using this platform, right? What does that look like, you know, between landowners and across districts? And, you know, there, I think the platform as it was designed for Rosedale really is to allow and facilitate uh, management with individual landowners, right, um, within the district. But there is opportunities to scale that. And what does that look like um, for the platform? And then maybe if, uh, if another neighboring district isn't using this platform, are there opportunities to then connect up? So I don't know, Eric or John, if you have thoughts on kind of scaling, you know, how this could grow across Kern, for example, and what, what might that look like, given that people might be using this open source platform, or maybe they're using another another tool. Sure, maybe I'll start and, and open it up for others. So, you know, Rosedale is um, pretty unique um, in, 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 in many ways, very, very simple. I think John used the term a, a soft landing, but, um, the, the idea in Rosedale is that we would um, develop the platform, um, implement it, and kind of beta test it for a few years uh, with the idea that we would grow it organically by partnering with adjoining water districts, um, assuming that their landowners were interested. We do have a number of common landowners, um, and our hope was that they would, they would become very comfortable and um, appreciate the value of the accounting side um, and play around a little bit in Rosedale with the trading side um, and then open the door to expanding um, our ability to trade outside of the Rosedale region um, and, and maybe start doing, you know, inter-district trades. There's lots and lots of policy issues associated with that. And so part of it is recognizing that to grow this, the trading side of it, you know, requires kind of extensive cooperation and coordination with adjoining districts. But, um, you know, we're very motivated to do this because, again, we don't want to strand the asset. And the story I've told several times is in my district, um, just because of the way we're structured, um, I had one landowner, um, you know, watering alfalfa. And across the street is a landowner with uh, an almond orchard that, because of the drought, didn't have any water supply. Um, in order to irrigate. And so that, you know, that, that clearly um, is a situation that could have been remedied, remedied if we had the ability to do these interdistrict trades. And so that's, that's kind of the, the goal is, you know, kind of dem demonstrate the, the capacity and the capability within Rosedale, but then reach out to our neighbors and grow it organically. And, and the idea behind the open source is they don't need to partner with us. They can develop it internally. They can, um, you know, modify it or edit it to fit their needs. And that was, that was a big part of this. So. I might just note that, um, you know, we, I showed the, the groundwater model that was um, pretty, pretty unique to Rosedale and developed by Rosedale. But um, if there, if a groundwater model exists to cover, uh, and I understand there are, are, are some that, that cover the larger Kern Basin, for example, um, we, we, we can uh, readily integrate um, that to, to cover other areas as well. Perfect, thank you, Jim. 
Well, we are one minute over time. So thank you so much for everyone who has stuck with us through um, the first uh, workshop. This is just the beginning of a conversation. We look forward to continuing to engage with you all on this. And uh, apologies if we didn't get to your question, um, please send those to us directly. And like I said, uh, thank you so much for your time. And please uh, remember to fill out the survey that John sent around and join us for workshop number two, which will be scheduled um, for early 2021, likely at the end of January, early February. And with that, have a wonderful afternoon. And thank you so much. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye.